<laughs> we're gonna find bodies that won't decompose because they've been they've been eating Twinkies and spraying themselves with Axe. This episode is brought to you by Universal FanCon. Universal FanCon is a brand new convention coming to the Baltimore Convention Center in April of 2018. FanCon will be a round-the-clock event featuring comics, cosplay, gaming, celebrity guests, music, and more with a focus on diversity and inclusion. Get your tickets now at UniversalFanCon.com because geek is universal. What's up, guys? It's The Blurred Girl here, and I'm back with an interview I'm really excited about. I get a chance to interview Dr. Rachel Burks. Now, I met the good doctor at Dragon Con last year, actually, when I was hanging out with Jamie Broadnax of Black Girl Nerds. We had such a great conversation. I, like, skipped the next two panels I was supposed to go to, and I got a chance to see Dr. Burks in action on a promo I was cutting for a science channel called Outrageous Acts of Science, which was awesome. If you haven't had a chance, you really need to check out the show. It's a lot of fun. One of the things I love about Dr. Burks is that she does this really cool blend of pop culture with science. So in this interview, we talk about what real life poison might have killed Joffrey on Game of Thrones. We talk about what Hulk's pants might be actually made of in reality, and a bunch of other really fun, goofy, science, geeky, comic book, TV, fantasy trope stuff. If you're wearing headphones, you need to turn the volume down because there's a lot of squeaking and squealing and giggling, and I'm not sorry. Now, I'm also really excited because not only is this interview available here on my YouTube channel. It's also available in audio form on my brand new podcast. So yes, The Blur Girl now has a podcast because I don't have anything else to do at all. I'm not busy. Currently, it's on SoundCloud. I will be expanding to iTunes and other things, hopefully very soon. So you can now check out this interview with Dr. Rachel Burks, as well as a couple of others that I've done up on SoundCloud. So sit back and enjoy this interview with Dr. Rachel Burks. Dr. Rachel Burks, who is, she's really important. She's got a lot of letters. There's like a a lot of things. So if you see her in the street, you have to call her Dr. Burks. Don't call her Rachel. Don't call her Ray Ray. She's not your friend. She is a doctor. Okay. <laughs> she is a doctor. Uh, she's my auntie <laughs> right. And you can call me Ray Ray. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I first saw you, I didn't meet you at first. When I first saw you, I was actually editing a promo for Outrageous Acts of Science for the Science Channel. And then cut to Dragon Con 2016. And I was hanging out with Jamie Broadnax of Black Girl Nerds. And she was like, oh, I'm going to meet Rachel Burks. I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I stuck around and I met you and then skipped my next two panels so we could talk about science. <laughs> so I've been really um, hoping. It was so fun. It was fun. It was fun. And so I was hoping um, that I could catch up with you as well as other members of the Curly hair mafia um to talk like science and geekdom so i'm thank you so much for being able to do this um interview with me so so that i don't mess this up tell everybody for the people who don't know what exactly you, like what your degree is in i know it's chemistry but tell us what branch of chemistry and then all of the things so I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry, a master's in forensic science, and a PhD in chemistry, but I'm an analytical chemist. So that means that I don't make chemicals, I find them. So I like to say that we're the detectives of chemistry. So you literally know how to get rid of the body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, without a trace. <laughs> Yes. I mean, you know, this is all contingent on, you know, like, like many things, one must have the proper tools. This is true. <laughs> and access and a strong stomach. I just yes. finished experiments on this. Really? You have to have it a, wow. <laughs> so what works isn't for everybody. <laughs> No, you know, sometimes the bench chemistry, it's not for everybody. <laughs> okay, so now what do you do? Are you still teaching or, because I know you're still on TV, do you? Yes. Okay, so where are you teaching and like if somebody wanted to enroll in a class? 
<laughs> so I am an assistant professor of chemistry at St. Edward University in Austin, Texas. It's a small liberal arts, principally undergraduate institution. Uh, it's a beautiful campus, overlooks downtown. Okay. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so I am, uh, my day job is, is chemistry professor. My night job is Misty Night. You, your website, and, and for those of you who don't know, it's 37. It's over on Scientopia.org but it's 37.scientopia.org. Now, tell me this connection with 37 and Dr. Wait, rubidium. I got to look it up. Is it, is it yttrium or yttrium? So my one handle before I got my PhD was radium yttrium. So the element, and elemental symbols would spell Ray, which has been my nickname right. mm-hmm. for a while. Um, but then when I got my PhD, the, the thing about chemists is that we have this thing with the periodic table. Yeah, I and know. You guys are like addicted love to it. it. <laughs> we just love it. We'll put it on ties, it's on pants, like we'll make a dress out of it. We love it. Shower <laughs> curtains. We just love it. And if you can find your name, you know, your initials as an element or spell something with an element, we just think that that's the best thing ever. Well, for me, my initials are RB and that's, that's rubidium. Rubidium. Okay. Now I get it. Okay. Whose atomic number is 37. So and that's, that's where that. the 37 comes from. Awesome. See, now I, I, I don't think there's anything on the periodic table that's KH, but I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe I'll put two things together but, now. But you do have to put two things together. So that's the key thing is can you spell it and not, not see sometimes people don't get lucky and they right. get this extra letter in there and then they get messed up. <laughs> But you actually have, you have potassium and hydrogen. That's very good. Oh, the other thing that I find fascinating about your website is that you also talk about like chemistry and pop culture. So very famously, or I think it's famous. If you haven't seen this, you've got to go check it out. You talked about how Joffrey, the element or the chemical that was used to kill Joffrey on Game of Thrones. And that is not a spoiler because if you haven't seen that, that was what, like season three or something if you haven't seen that (laughs) i actually thought it was a version of nightshade but it i don't think it is no you know because um you know there were some real good plant options and and when you read the description in the books and and the symptoms no it's got to be something that affects muscle because of the way that it's described Mm -hmm. um and so there's a different um, plant options, and they're all horrible. Uh, right, right. <laughs> they're all terrible. Some affect smooth muscle, and some affect striated muscle. Mm-hmm. And the, the specific one that I thought about was strychnine because it's awful, King yeah. Joffrey's death. And I'm not saying he didn't deserve it because a little snot did. But the way it's described is excruciatingly painful. It's a, you know, in the kingdoms, it's a very scary poison. Like mm-hmm. of all the poisons, that's like that one you don't want to get. Right. And, you know, with strychnine, the, you know, it, it causes the muscles specific muscles to contract so violently they can sometimes rip straight from the bone. Oh my God. Yeah, really painful. And the initial contractions too start in the face and neck. And that's um, how Joffrey went. Okay. And that's very sounds like a straight, like, you know, so the how it's described is, you know, literally feeling like you're being strangled. And it gives you this weird facial expression. Some might call it a smile, but a grimace. Yeah. Um, and really it's the kind of thing too, that if you want someone to suffer, right, this is, and at, especially in this kind of time period, there's, yeah. there's no antidote. There's no antidote now. I mean, it's, it's kind of like you try to treat it the best you can, but if you get an acute poisoning dose, you're going to suffer. And then you're and, going to die. And then you're going to die. Right. <laughs> like, There's no coming uh, back from this. And so even if it's short, it's incredibly painful. painful. Okay. So I really think like some of it just really fits in. And I think also kind of fits in a bit. You know, Martin's never kind of revealed what his inspiration is. Mm-hmm. But I just feel like if you wanted him to suffer, and I think that's a character that a lot of people were like, suffer. Right, right, right. <laughs> and it sounds like it could have grown in that type of climate. Yeah, I think the thing too is that, you know, there's so many different kingdoms. You had a certain, that's you know, true. kind of 
alchemist class sure, that true. would have derived this um and the, brought it, it over very, brought it over and there was a very protracted kind of way that it was um from a natural product that it was it wasn't made it was just extracted from this tree and a mm-hmm. strychnine tree there's strychnine um all over the tree but it's really in kind of these seed pods that it's really condensed um but there was a case not that long ago of somebody that just boiled enough leaves to to hurt themselves it was um, oh my a suicide god. case oh my god it's clearly didn't know that much about yeah. it because you don't want to go like that after what you just described well, you know, they did. I mean, people set themselves on fire, but That's I think true. part of it too, there's no coming back from this one. That's true. And if you give yourself the right dose, right, wrong dosage, um, but also the way he describes how, how it's made. The tricky thing with this is that it, it like all alkaloid plant based poisons they're very bitter um and so i think that's why when he describes the treatment of of kind of how it's prepared and what it's usually served in uh wine Mm -hmm. right and it's always Uh, kind of seems like it's implied it's a red yeah because that's dry guys yeah yeah and if it was a spiced holiday wine or something for a special occasion, that would disguise it even more. And so I think that it kind of fits. But then there was some really, really good. I think that's a fun thing too. Chemists, you know, we there was a couple other good suggestions. You know, maybe it was nicotine, which I think huh. you, know, you know, nicotine is incredibly toxic. But I, I didn't know you could. I I mean, we know it can kill you slowly over a long period of time. But I I didn't realize that enough of it in a small dose. Well, the amounts that people usually have, you know, with smoking is, is, you know, that's kind of a chronic kind Mm -hmm. of a deal. You know, Mm -hmm. we're not usually exposed to this acute um, poisoning, but oh yeah, it'll, it'll do the trick. We just, that's just not a a level, right? Even with, with, what cracks me up is especially not that long ago, a lot of poison and drugs you could just like walk to your local pharmacy and be That's- like hey bob give me some cocaine i'll take some arsenic and by the way i need some strychnine like- right 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 there's some stuff like i've i've traveled i mean my mother's not from this country but i know that when you travel sometimes you can go to pharmacies in other countries and it's like what wait wait, wait a minute i can buy this like tylenol <laughs> Exactly. Or, you know, really, you know, you just if, if you know what you're looking for, you know, you can you can find some very interesting things that at your local home store. That's true. Shall we say. That's true. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, it doesn't have to be. And sometimes I just did this experiment for my camera shoot about body disposal. And I oh my was thinking like, and I was joking. Oh, my God. No, I was <laughs> And joke. She's One like, does no. not joke about these important scientific questions. <laughs> I love it. One does not joke about. One does not joke about bodily dis- disposing of a body. What? <laughs> uh, so I did this experiment, and all the ingredients I got, you know, in the uh, in the home store, and I, I did that on purpose. Sure, as a chemist, I have access to all kinds of things, mm-hmm. but they know that I have access to these things. Like right. I didn't use something. Like only you could have gotten that. Um, so you know, you go to the home store, and I uh, went to the home store and bought a few things, and you know, did this experiment, and I used pork, a there you go. pork rib, there you go, and a pork neck bone for science. There you go. So yeah, so we do these experiments, and hopefully, hopefully, you'll see the video. I, I have video. Awesome. <laughs> and and now that I've scared everyone. Uh, <laughs> Well, no, let's go to some life-saving techniques because you also had um, what I call the zombie apocalypse perfume, how they're attracted to smell, but not going to the extremes that Michonne did with having to like walk around with two carcasses. <laughs> yeah, the walking, I mean, you know, that's that's what tells me too that, you know, I know I'm a chemist and I'm a process person being analytical. We're almost a bit engineering. I saw that and I was like, oh, no, no girl. <laughs> like no you're doing it wrong <laughs> it's you know you know and even from the first episode where they do it you know uh episode three in season one called guts i'm like this is just you this is not sustainable it's not you can't scale it up right right like this is a biohazard there's mm-hmm. what, what is the reliability of the supply here like what, like all these like you know and i just realized i'm like we can do better we can do better well i mean did you and see literally. did you see world war z Yes. Okay, so like yeah. that 
what that thing that he took that changed his chemistry that's more of what you're talking about right i mean he ingested right. it he didn't spray it but he ingested it but right and you know what you know what i love about that scene and i showed the scene from um to talk about how scientists work mm -hmm. like literally the process of science because when they're on that rooftop in walking dead um episode three of season one they really do they look at a problem they say you know from all sides they listen to everyone's opinion they crowdsource a solution and they test the hypothesis now granted it's a high stakes test yeah um, but but the process of really going step by step how do we know what are they doing what's the data we have they look at all the data they have they form a hypothesis and then they test it and you know, chemical, chemical camouflage is not something that humans do themselves. Like, we get that from animals. Yeah. Right? Like, they use it all the time mm -hmm. to disguise each other, both visually and um, yeah. chemically. Chemically. And all, all effectually, I guess. All <laughs> the whole thing. They're fooling people. It's, it's one big, you know, flim flam mm -hmm. out there trying to just either not be seen or to sneak into places you shouldn't be, kind of like me into Neiman Marcus. You are hilarious. <laughs> you belong in Neiman Marcus. Stop it. The two is like we use it. We learned that kind of trick is is not to be seen. Like you know, hunters use it all the time, but really it strips all human scent. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, and you can buy, you know, you don't want to use fancy soaps, no axe body spray if you're going to shoot a deer. You know, they're going to smell that. Right? <laughs> and so we'll I'll literally hear that. Are you deer hunters? Yes, we'll all smell you. Actually, I don't think most people should be wearing axe body spray, but that's just me. <laughs> It's just I me. agree, but I have a I have a feeling it'll be the only thing left after the apocalypse. Yeah, axe and roaches. Twinkies. <laughs> oh god. Rows of. Uh, <laughs> We're gonna find bodies that won't decompose because they've been they've been eating Twinkies and spraying themselves with axe. I've uh, seen the future. <laughs> <laughs> Those are going to be the zombies. Yes. <laughs> they can't decompose. This is why a good friend of mine is like, you know what? I know you'll take me out because you know I can't cut it. <laughs> and this is exactly why. This is why you have to make decisions now and get that friend that will do you a solid. There you go. And hesitate. Like Naomi, like Naomi Harris. I will not hesitate. Because <laughs> I love you, girl. <laughs> It's like, I'm not. Oh, God. Okay, so I have a couple of other questions. And I now, I don't I don't know. This doesn't sound like your branch of chemistry. But I've had, I'm asking every chemist I know, what in the world are they making hoax pants out of? I know that's more fabrication. I but I can't handle the fact that they're just like Levi's 501s. And then they're like... <laughs> Magic bean. No, um, magic beans. There you now, go. Now, this is an interesting question because there are a lot of superheroes that have suits that don't make any sense, right? Yeah. I mean, you've mm. got the hoax pants. So you're talking like, sure, they stretch. What is that, Lycra? No, like that's beyond. Like they can try. Like there's yeah. something going. They rip, then they're back. Then they rip, then they're back. Um, but then they're sentient. I mean, it's like, is it a stripper pant? Like. <laughs> Is it NBA pants? You know, they just, uh, just yeah. right there, fly away. Exactly. <laughs> you know, like what's going on there? But also, you've got you know, when you think about anybody, when you think about the Flash, that suit doesn't make any sense either. No, I was going to bring the up the Flash. Sure. Nope. You know, the fact that the tremendous force. I mean, it, the friction caused by this. Tip. But what I think is, there's there's a lot of options. There's always literally space materials. NASA yeah. is always trying to handle, I mean, when you try to explore the surface of Mars or some of their re-entry temperature issues, they're always trying to fluctuate these things and control those things. They, they are doing work for special types of fire suits that can withstand up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which like boggles my mind. Wow. So they have layers of liquid cooling and then above that kind of a high-tech fabric. And part of it too is making... <clears throat> Thin enough materials that are moldable, not just for, I mean, of course, we think about aircraft, we right. think about 
really high tech stuff. But when we get into personal right. flight, I don't want to. I don't want to put on a jacket made out of fuselage. No. <laughs> So, you know, the problem with like a traditional Iron Man suit, if it was literally made out of iron, he couldn't he move. Couldn't carry it, right? I've like, been telling everybody this: like he would not be able to move. And it's he... got to be an alloy, right? Exactly. It's, it's got to be. Of course, you don't say I'm an I'm an iron titanium iridium alloy. That doesn't have the flow. As Iron Man, flow. right? Right. That's awesome. <laughs> so you know, there's there's a lot of options, but I think what's exciting is that you know science fiction always takes I think a little bit of fact and stretches it, and in this case, there's been a lot of work, especially in the last decade, in what's called self-healing materials. Um, and so... It is sentient. You, <laughs> yeah. And really what it's done is you've, you've kind of built in a first aid kit into these materials. And in a way where you there was one material that they had a really nice article in Chemistry Rolled On where they made this polymer, so that's just, you know, sh- you know stretchy things mm-hmm. that we're used to, these individual molecules linked together. And what they did is between the polymers, they packed in, again, this, this backup, this first aid kit, where if it somehow got ripped, the monomer, mm-hmm. more monomer, and what polymerized it would be there. So when it ripped, they'd be exposed, they'd repolymerize and plug up and the hole. Then the chemical reaction would begin. Interesting. So there are other self healing polymers where if you break it, it causes some type of chemical reaction on the surface, but then if you put it back together, it will then re-react and, and literally fuse back together. Now, of course, there's a limit to how strong those things would be, but again, the basis of fact of having material that can actually fix itself, mm-hmm. um, and really what it means is you've, you've given it an internal what I call internal first aid kit to do yeah, that. Yeah. And so, you know, what I'm imagining is it, instead of thinking about Hulk's pants as being like it, they, they stretch, they, whatever, they, whatever, what if it really is a self healing polymer and what you're looking at is when it's ripped, because that's really actually more true, is that self healing polymers don't usually work that fast. They need to be brought back into contact or given right. some time in order to actually have the chemistry work and refuse. So what if it's actually some type of self healing polymer textile, and it's not <clears throat> far fetched. A lot of our nylon is a polymer, mm-hmm. you know, so it's not too far fetched. And really, then by the time he goes down to a certain size it actually can then redo its magic right and really it's science. and that's the and that's the chemical reaction maybe when it gets to when it's not when the stretching has reached a particular limit like it learns hulk's limit it then will shrink whenever he does you know if they if he has these pants he is a scientist a medical doctor and in, mm-hmm. in some versions mm-hmm. If what he has done is picked a high tech fabric, which that's a very big growth industry. Not only that, but self healing polymers in the medical community for bandages, for synthetic skin, for skin grafts, there is a lot of applications. And so what if it's some, I mean, again, we have to take this basic stuff and really sci-fi it up, Mm -hmm. but I think that there's something there. And the other one that brings in other suits would be spider silk. There's, you know, when they make these companies, this isn't that little worker spider slaving Mm -hmm. away for $14 an hour. Like this is all synthetic now. I'm mad that you said that they're slaving. I'm mad that we're paying the spiders. I'm mad (laughs) that we're paying the spiders $14 an hour. There's no spiders involved. It's all, you know, they, they're engineering synthetic silk. They're also adding things in like carbon fiber mm-hmm. um, and nanotubes. And then there's a certain alignment to maximize heat distribution and increase different tensile strengths. Um, and so, you know, the fun thing to me, too, is whenever you hear this research, to me and to a lot of scientists and to science writers, they're like, so Spider-Man suit. You're saying we can make Spider-Man soon. <laughs> That's what I would be saying if I was in the room. <laughs> yeah, like whenever they have those, there was a cool work a couple years ago. There's, you know, about cloaking devices where it's really, a tr- it's literally a trick of the light. Mm-hmm. You know? And of course, everybody was like, Harry Potter. <laughs> you know? That's awesome. Harry Potter. <laughs> You know, and, and, and 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, it would have been like Star Trek. That's true. That's true. No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And, that, and now we're all, we're, and, well, we could be saying Star Trek again. 
<laughs> I'm very excited. You know, to me, like growing up on Next Generation and watching the original yeah. with my dad is I literally have a tricorder, right? I'm like, uh, 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 <laughs> things. actually, you mentioned something that I did want to ask you uh, about Tony Stark. Okay, so you remember in the second movie where, I mean, okay, we're just going to put the, 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 the suit aside for a second and the fact that he had a small reactor in his chest, which A, we're not biologists, but I still think that's dangerous. <laughs> but the palladium, when he realized that the palladium, which I'm mad that he had palladiums the size of Pop-Tarts and he could just put them in and out, that that bothered me. But, but besides the fact that we can make palladium Pop-Tarts, <laughs> when he realized it was going to kill him, and then we, he, he said, okay, I'm going to just make a new element. Yeah, now, we can do that. Now, the, <laughs> but my question is the way he made it, like, is that literally like when you're trying to make an element, is that like, are you literally running it that fast through yes. like a tube? That is a particle accelerator. That's literally what a particle, I mean, he, that's a homemade one, but that's basically yeah. what a particle. Well, that's the thing is, is now, is it that easy? Is it on that scale? No, no. but that is literally how you do it. But at CERN. <laughs> so that's, but that's what I was going to tell you. So ask you. So the, the particle accelerator at CERN is not going to fit on two floors of a building. It's like a campus, no. right? It's running like. Yeah, and I think that then Lawrence Livermore, uh, in which there's an element named after, um, that would be another location. It's a smaller one. But I think the idea is, you know, the funny thing is our instruments get smaller and smaller all the time. When I started as an undergraduate, the type of analytical instruments. This- I this little use. thing is holding like yeah. gigs and remember when gigs right. used to be doorstops you know well just remember look at you know like a movie like hidden <clears throat> figures you're looking at yes. a computer that you're like um sorry what is this matt like this whole room is what you know and for me and, just and that whole span, room that whole room was five gigs yeah that's it <laughs> Or that's even it. five megs. <laughs> Maybe. You know, nobody have anything complicated to do, like send nope. someone to space. Nope. Like, you know, and when I think about just in my time of undergraduate to grad school, the size of what's called the mass spectrometer mm-hmm. went crazy small that actually you could conceivably with you know, backup generator, make it portable. That it's wow. not only the fact that you came up with a new type of ionization source, but you were able to do it in the size of what would now be about this big, right? So the size of, I'd say, a tower computer mm-hmm. and maybe two of those. That, you know, when, I, when I'm looking at mass specs in my grad school, it took, again, took up an entire room to have that kind of power. So yes, it is based on something. Can we do it at that size now? No, but in a hundred years, in a thousand years, I... it might not even be that long. It might not even be. I mean, the, the the jump that we make advancements when you think about, you know, the off quoted thing that you know we have now in our phones more computing power than all of NASA in the late well, yeah, and, 60s. and the fact that we all <laughs> we're watching TV on our phones and our and the most popular form of transportation is to get into a stranger's car. <laughs> I mean, no, think about it. This is like the very thing that we were raised to absolutely Never not do. do. Never get into a stranger's car. Now there's people. Car. Now people do it all the time. And I remember and when it came you, out. You're just like, sorry, what? Exactly. You want me to do what? But what I love though is too is that your, the ways in which we communicate now, and and for my grandmother. You know, this is a person who grew up where they thought it was really exciting that when the first time they got a phone. Look, my mo- my mother, one of my brothers thought it would be cool to get her like a touch. It's not quite an iPhone, but it's like a touchscreen phone. She figured out text messaging. Oh my God. Oh my God. Now she text messages me guilty texts. You don't love me anymore, do you? Best day of my life was when my dad got an iPhone and figured out emojis. Parents on emojis are like, that's like a whole nother episode. <laughs> I think sometimes he just goes, and just clicks. It like just it's, oh. <laughs> But I spend like so much time looking at it going, this mm. means something. Exactly. And all he's doing is like, <laughs> he's just like, he's key smashing. Yeah. He's just... <laughs> He doesn't even know. He's trying to use his big giant dad thumb. And he's just <laughs> like 22 emojis and his daughter on the other end is like, but what does it mean? <laughs> this is what yeah. happens. This is what happens with science. In, a, um, in, a, in another year, he'll learn. He can just say smiley emoji. Right. It won't be as fun. Oh my God. It'll be a mess. <laughs> it'll be a mess when they figure that out. Cause they'll be like, okay, call 
call my daughter and tell her or get my daughter's car and get it to drive her to me. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm absolutely dead when that happens because I won't be, I'll be trying to go to the grocery store and all of a sudden I'm at my mother's house. Why am I here? <laughs> I'm like, Mom, how many times have I told you? <laughs> Don't hack the car. <laughs> Obviously, Black Panther's a big thing. So I have to ask the question, could vibranium actually exist? See, they kind of sell it as if it's some type of a metal. They do. Out of this earth. Yeah. Um, and we've got, the fun thing is, is that, you know, most of the things on the periodic table are metals. But so vibranium, you know, is it is it a pure metal? How could you make, no, you know, because the, the thing we know about metals is it has a lot of metallic properties. Mm -hmm. It's malleable. Um, it's got a certain of, of hardness and strength to it. But some of the other properties about like turning vibrational, like some of the other things that you're like, okay, so that's the sci-fi part. This is the science part. And that's the sci-fi part um, is that. You know, it just, it breaks down under some of the other metallic type properties. But one of the, because this is the same material in the cap shield. Right. And so one of the other things that it, it does is it supposedly, because part of the problem, if you made, say, the Captain Shield or Black Panther's Claws out of, like, steel, which is great, first of all, you know, heavy. Yeah. If you made a solid steel. But, I mean, these are superheroes. Okay. Um, but, but also... The heat that the the heat that would be generated, some of they they hit some of these things, or the force that would come yeah. back on them when it's being transferred. Um, so that could be a problem because again, what they're interacting with is not like normal human force of even like two steel cars running into each other. You got like Thor's hammer, which is some mystical nonsense, um, <laughs> and hitting it this thing with this. You know, then you got lightning, and then you got like weirdness, and so the, it's it's like. It, it won't hold up. But what's interesting about this particular fictional one is that they clearly gave us some thought because they have this vibrational energy or kinetic energy, as some people would say kinetic, some would say vibrational, mm -hmm. that gets transferred into light energy. And so if you see certain parts of the movies yeah. where like Thor's hammer hits the cap shield, you'll see this blue light. Yes, yes. And that is, so to, instead of tra having the heat, having energy be, you know, captured as heat, which would be a problem. We'd have a real problem if you generated that much heat energy because the shield would potentially melt or just be so hot that the captain would be like, I'm out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's not good. And then imagine if that was claws. That, right. that also doesn't work. Um, but what they've done is by making it that the, the energy, because energy cannot, you know, what we tell students is energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can't be transferred. And what they've done is they've changed it so that that blue light means that it's going from one form of energy, a vibrational and or kinetic, it depends on which part you're reading, to being light energy. So the light, as soon as it hits it, this material is transferring it into light energy, which is not science fiction. That could be true. That actually could happen. So, yes. And so that is not there. Again, that's what I love about sci-fi is there's limits, right? But there's bits of it. They clearly put in. Because why blue? Because the other thing about blue light is that of all the visible light in that region, mm -hmm. that's towards the high energy. Okay. And so why didn't they choose red or purple or, you know, something on the low? Because... You know, and, and, and maybe we'll never know some of these answers because when these things were created or who knows, but they chose blue because when you think about it, sometimes blue light is often, you know, high energy light. Mm -hmm, you see mm -hmm. it. And so it's interesting to me that they're trying to communicate that a lot of energy has has is happening in this hit. This mm -hmm. has been a forceful interaction and they're saying that by having it be blue but they also want you to see it because yeah. there are higher orders of electromagnetic energy but they're not visible to the eye so they've picked the maximum near the maximum that the human eye would be able to see right uh, and still register as holy crap mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly 
So I think that, you know, closest we could probably get is it wouldn't be a pure metal. It would be an alloy or maybe even something like a, a, a ceramic metal. You know, if you want something really strong and durable and heat resistant, that to me is going to be a a mixed material. Well, could it, it be mixed with be. could it be mixed with something like volcanic that could take high amounts of pressure and heat? Well, the rock, though, is not, I mean, that would be more of a geology question, but rock, as far as malleability, as far as being able to shape it, I mean, Mm -hmm. because these are also shaped into very, you know, specific layers, Mm -hmm. and that is going to be a problem for rock, because rocks have that kind of crystal structure in order to allow, or, you know, kind of structure to allow that particular, not that it, not that it cannot be shaped, we've, we've clearly right. seen, you know, with time, it, but that's kind of almost an erosion. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, if you if you actually crushed it and then and then pressed it under, you know, like a hydraulic press, but even then, the material itself is not kind of made for that. But right. when you think about ceramics, which this is another, mm-hmm. you know, really high quality top knives that are very very sharp. Yeah, are ceramic. Um, are ceramic, um, and then ceramic, especially in the lab. Um, aren't there some watch- Aren't there some surgical instruments that are ceramic? absolutely, and it does a great job. Um, there are different materials too that help with heat um, that are, sometimes you don't want things to conduct heat at all. You want right. them to literally be heat sinks. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, that could be another thing is to me, a lot of the, in all of the superhero universes, whenever you have a material that sounds like, wow, that sounds too good to be true. That's because it's not an element. It's, it is got to be material science. Because like a hybrid. Okay. A hybrid, and and the thing is, this is nothing new. You know, when we think about steel, steel is an alloy. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of our best properties are just it just takes a scotch of something else to kind of give us this new thing. And so and and but we're there though, especially with textile science is really exciting. It's not just fashion, which is cool because you want to look badass in your suit. Um, <laughs> But the but if but if the is, suit if but if the suit has the healing polymers that's even more exciting. That's even more exciting, and if you can still make it red, also nice. But here's the thing: um. you can get you that that uh, that license or that patent will be a higher payoff for like from NASA or like um, Elon Musk than it will be from like Neiman Marcus. And I think so. it's not a mistake that you have Iron Man who runs this industry, right? Yeah. And who then turns out to make all of this stuff. And and part of it is the massive research and development funds that must be going on here. Like the idea that the altruism comes because you're basically an arms dealer, as we all, you know, yeah. you have this idea. But who else would be able to afford the level of research dollars that would because for every successful Endeavor. Yeah. Every one. There's like 10 failures, right? 99 fail. I don't know. Oh, 99. Wow. At at least because, I mean, and that's the thing is they're not failures in a way that's bad. It's like, how else do you get to the thing that works without doing all of this research? And it can't just work once. It has to be, you know, oh, I think we got it to work that one time. So go ahead and jump out of that airplane. And like, (laughs) no, but you're right. I actually heard Elon Musk say that, you know, in a, um, in a, it wasn't a TED talk, but it was in a talk once, and they were, he was explaining how he got from like PayPal to SpaceX, and he was saying how his first two years he had budgeted to fail, and he said it's just some, the tune of something like three or four trillion dollars that he had to have that much money to yes. fail, and I was like, what? But that yeah, imagine, yeah, I mean, that's, that's science. If you're not budgeting that in, and I was just reading up, there was a great article, speaking of fun spider silk science, there's a great review, very written for the general audience in chemistry world called, called Spinning Out Spider Science. Wow. And it talks about these companies that all, there's there's three, they identify three major ones. Um, and they all started about 2007, 2008, and they all budgeted for it to be 10 years before they had real massive mass production to be commercialized. Do you know how much, I mean, when you think about, you know, not only just to be successful, but how much money you would have had to raise and continue to raise to be basically Mm non-profit earning. Yeah. (laughs) Which which, Which means that there's things that 10, 10 years ago that 
we saw on Star Trek that somebody started working on that are yes. going to come out in like another five years. We just don't see it. But that's the fun thing is, you know, we're starting to see that science of and it, and it sounds silly, but it's everything from, you know, cosmetics to um, tennis shoes. And like I always tell my students, what you almost pray for as a scientist, especially one that's on a budget, is that you want the application, mm -hmm. the thing you're using to reach mass appeal because the unit price will start to drop and right. then you can get it yourself, right? And so any of the application, like if it's if this synthetic spider silk is like the top new material for runners in Nike, then they're going to start mass producing it to like the whole price we'll of drop. this yeah. other industry drives. And so that's kind of the, the weird and wonderful loop around is sometimes like the cosmetic industry, all that research that's gone on now and like the microbiome and we know how important it is for human health. Of course, the cosmetics industries are like we got to get in on this exactly. right like so i think it's it's kind of a fun and that's what i think too about the superhero thing that's that's why another reason why certain universes like with the tony stark thing that's completely believable because that's kind of how you would be able to make all these advances now that you know he's basically everybody's superhero godfather like yeah. i don't know it's kind of weird yeah he's <laughs> funding I, everybody yeah, yeah where's his art like where's his director of r&d because this guy needs to be, can we just get him off the company floor for one minute? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's what I think Pepper is constantly trying to do. Now I have not, I have another, two other quick questions for you now. I don't know how quick they are. Let me, let me not say that. Let me not lie. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, you mentioned, I thought you mentioned nanites earlier um, or nano, nanotechnology. Nanotubes. Nanotubes. Sure. Okay. Now have you also, and I, now, Explain nanotubes to me a little bit and the whole concept, and this is a little, another little sci-fi sci thing, like of nanites and the whole concept. That's not just healing fabric. That would be like uh, healing like tissue. Now I know that's biology. I'm just, right. I, when I'm, but I'm, the concept of the nanotechnology of making something a, like a little tiny machine that can think on its own independently or in a swarm how like like if i could basically program my roomba to to program other roombas and then clean not just my house but several houses at once is this possible <laughs> Well, that's, you know, that's computer programming is amazing. And again, our computers are getting smaller and smaller. No, but is that what a nanite you know, is? A nanite is a computer, correct? Well, if you'd wanted to do the things that you're describing, well, yeah. you've got to have something that's programmable. To reprogram my uh, Roomba, yes. But to, to rebuild, yeah. but to rebuild like an arm, that's both machine well, and biology. You'd need a you need a damn good immune system. I think that's I think that's, that's really the true. key thing to like any of the super soldiers is true. because the other thing you want to think about is we have a very good the the average human being barring any um, major life occurrences or major illnesses has a really good immune system and we're good in a lot of ways. We reject things that we call foreign and we're going to annihilate them. Yeah. Right. That works great. Um, and of course, we have through science made that even better with some super awesome vaccines that help us do that even more and keep everything in check. And we have natural healing processes. You know, even if there's a bit of scarring, the fact that clotting works to plug up holes and stop massive blood loss. Mm -hmm. And then we've got white blood cells that come in and do their thing. And we've got antibodies and they're doing their thing. We've got an inflammation response. Like there's this whole, you know, multi-level thing going on. What you would need is you would need all of that to be like dialed to like 11 million, right? So that, and that's, and what, that's what Captain America has then. He is like, he's not he's, a super soldier. He's got a super immune system. He's got a super immune system. Because the other thing you want to think about is, or at least I think about is, you know, we, a human body for a lot of things doesn't like foreign I mean our whole immune system is like no no foreign 
And the thing is you want it to recognize because what happens is when it doesn't recognize things and tag them as foreign is when is when things go no, off bit, the rails. Yeah, when things go very um, bad. And so, you know, we know this works when we try to do transplants, which are incredibly difficult from a mechanistic standpoint, but from also a biological, biochemical standpoint, is that that's why you have to be on immunosuppressants for a lot of different types of transplants. Because if it recognizes the new kidney or the new liver as an enemy, it will start eating it from the inside out and doing a full organ. So think about us. That's part of the challenge, too, with science. Of course, we do hip implants. We do knee implants. So how are we able to do that? Well, we use inert material. You're literally a stealth, Mm -hmm. like a stealth freaking thing. And you're just you're going under the radar and not picking something that triggers. This is a huge area of research, especially in the military, where you have folks that lose limbs or Mm -hmm. like a part of the skull or you lose a part of the jaw or, again, an elbow. And you've got to worry about still having mobility and being able to do this thing um, and have it work really well. And then we think about all the connective tissue, all the ligaments, Mm -hmm. all of the the caps. And so all of that, you have to design it out of non-rejectable materials. That's a massive, another material science, a massive level that you have to pick something that does the job, but also can do the extra job of not being seen. Yeah, but won't kill you or in process (laughs) because your body is trying to reject it. So even if, you know, my thing with that is even if you built these little nanobots, then, okay, so you've done enough research to know that you had to have built all of them to not trigger their immune response or this person on a massive level of immunosuppressants, which would mean they'd have to be in a clean room because then yeah. if they got the common cold or MRSA, they are toast. They're right? dead. You know? Yeah, because they have so, nothing to fight it. But I think, again, the 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 accelerated thing um, of kind of the sci-fi thing is we're always looking for new surgical and chemical tools. And there's been work in, you know, there's like, you know, precision laser scalpels now that can make cuts that you don't even, you know, they're not even cuts on the external, they're internal, yeah. maybe they are external, but they're so small. You're doing this there's, level of precision yeah. surgery now that's like mind boggling. But then there's also ideas of instead of stitches or, you know, certain, you're, you're using now chemicals to actually fuse areas together things heal faster you know there's all of these advances that are going on in medicine i think that you have a combination of okay if we if we were able to advance all of this research right at warp speed nine (laughs) this work that's going on and then into and and that kind of gets back to with kind of the some of the spider stuff and Mm -hmm. the self-filling polymers is this is also the work that's been done these are things that are not rigid they're not triggering the human um, immune immune response or yeah. mammalian response. So that's going to help quite a bit because secondary infections, you know, I always that's my mind. No, you're right. That that's the thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that, no, that's the thing. I mean, I, my father, who's no longer with us. It, it's, but our biggest issue with him when he had a series of strokes was not the strokes. It was all of the other infections and things like that, that started to sit in because he could not move. He, yeah. you know what I mean? He, so, it's, you don't realize how many things. All that... these other things. So if you think about it, if you had a combination of, of stealth materials and these um, increased, you know, fusion, instead of having some of these kind of, we're still using the same type of scalpels, right? Mm-hmm, that we've been mm-hmm. using for a long time, the same type of sutures, but, but we're, we're, even those are rapidly changing. And also just, you know, you had an increased immune, that for magically you yeah. had, you know, twice as many macrophages mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. you know, okay, so that's the sci-fi part. So if you gave everybody a boost, but then also you had these new materials with low infection and then, and then if you just actually listen to nurses who are like, use this checklist and mm-hmm. wash your freaking hands, <laughs> protocols that are in place that are now just bringing down the secondary ones. And the thing is, like you were saying with your father is, and, and like with my father is, is that if you could heal faster and get up yes. and start doing therapy, then you in turn heal faster. Like yeah. it's this, this whole, you know, and then your mood improves and we know that mood, um, there's been good work on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that helps everything. So I really think it's, it's never going to be a one and done like, Oh, all we need are nanobots. No, we yeah. would still need that increased human immune the response. Immune, immune response is the big and, thing. Yeah. You know, the last question I have for you is I read somewhere that you worked in forensics. 
So I yes. would like to know from the, first of all, I'm sure shows like CSI must have made you nuts. How much of it, like they do stuff on the show in like 10 minutes and I'm sure you were like, right. <laughs> And, my, and my favorite though, yeah, is I love it because you know the one thing I always tell you know people always ask me you know what's what's the biggest difference I'm like you never saw anyone doing paperwork nope there was never and a report I written good <laughs> never they're never writing anything down number one which no. I'm always like interesting um, even on even on bones. Even on bones, no one's no, even like, like <laughs> they just walk around. <laughs> are you eating this? Like, and that's the thing is there are you know if you're a medical examiner there there might be a recording, but mm -hmm. you're still literally you're still taking notes. Like that's what cracks me up though too is, and as a scientist, like documentation, documentation, like everything has to be written down or it didn't happen, and it has to be written down extemporaneously, so at the time it occurs. Right. So paperwork, and not only that, but you're writing reports for other people who are not scientists. So you spend a lot of your time you know sure doing the thing and then you spend most of the time documenting the thing and then communicating the thing that you just documented <laughs> so um and what i didn't spend any time doing was interviewing suspects or running down some damn dark alley with a gun with a gun with some <laughs> damn good looking shoes I that never happened that never happened that never happened no well what is what is what is the what is the craziest like uh, case you were ever on though? Like, how did this happen? You know, I will I will say it's three words. Uh oh, Craig's Craigslist crime. Whoa! You know, for a while there, there was like, could you just not with Craigslist? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, and it's funny for I've never used it for that very reason because I remember hearing all the craziness. And this is, but this is before this is even before Uber when we were not getting into strangers' cars. I would not let a stranger in my house to buy a piece of furniture. <laughs> You would hear like this, you know, because for the most part, again, we're very, we come in to do a technical job or mm -hmm. we get case evidence. We're not, we don't have as much background. We're not in the scene. We're not detectives. Yeah. So we don't know. But when you would maybe go to a scene or you would hear enough about, you're like, this is the most bizarre because you know, <laughs> everything becomes routine even yeah. working in a crime lab like a yeah. breaking and entering is a b and &E. like you're yeah. not gonna see but then there's something that come across your desk and you're like i don't this is like that happened Kyle, you're like <laughs> shetty <laughs> I don't know what crime was committed with an avocado and a machete. And there's like a burnt out Tesla downstairs. Like, what? <laughs> so you then though you're like, wow, that's I don't know. But then you flip a page, you're like Craigslist. <laughs> That's insane. I've never used a Craigslist. I'm so, I haven't used it. And now you've like cemented that for me. Thank you, you know, so when, much for, for don't go on Craigslist. No, I should, don't go on Craigslist. Craigslist. <laughs> You're great. So listen, um, you are going to be back at Dragon Con this year. Will you be doing the how to get away with murder panel? Not sure yet. I'm, okay. I'm, maybe because it was popular and people are People want to know how to kill people, apparently. They're always looking for ideas. <laughs> I heard you got some interesting questions in there. <laughs> we got some. I've got, I got pictures, though. I'm going to keep my eye. That's what I'm saying. Oh, I mean, there, did anybody ever ask you a question in that panel where you were like, I really can't answer that? Like, I'm not going to answer that. Just something feels wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny because it's it's more of it's always ones too about how to make something like, can you really make mess that way? Yes. And I'll let you Google it so that when they seize your computer and clear your, your history, it will not be on uh, me. Right. Oh, you know. um, but we hope to do I would love to do um, a superhero science panel. Um, I, I am going to try and make it happen. Like, uh, Luke, Luke Cage science um panel i think again these areas like we we could have spent another few hours talking yeah. about all the wackiness and we haven't even gotten to wonder woman and i think that that there's going to be tons of great science in that so i think it's there's just tons to do I no think. there is and it, even if they don't we're going to prove they should give us a panel i'm going to have you come back on here and we're going to do this again and then we're going to send these videos to people until they give us a panel <laughs> <laughs> because there should totally be a science fiction panel. We should totally, yes, Wonder Woman. I have a whole theory about Luke Cage, but... <laughs> 
<laughs> because of the way they cooked him on the outside, but then everything happens on the inside. That doesn't work for me. It had to be internal. I'm sorry. I'm not a scientist, but that's just, that doesn't make sense. It's not. We I, ha- I tell <laughs> you, I have this panel idea for them and we pitched it. And hopefully, because Black Girl Nerds was going to moderate. Yes. Uh, uh, and so there, there's so much in that show. And in the, and then of course, then in the defenders, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of associated stuff, but you've got the, there's so many good things as a chemist, you know, I'm like, ah. but then I have a friend who's an immunologist who was like, I got many questions. <laughs> Somebody I got questions. Wait, but your buddy that's a part of the curly hair mafia, she's a biologist. I can't remember her yep. name right now. What's her yep. name again? Danielle. Danielle. She's a biologist. I want her and you. <laughs> Yeah, and our friend Lolly is a biologist too, and awesome. like really knows about, um, you know, because Danielle's a mammologist, so she really knows mammalian oh, behavior, okay. which is great. And I think in this again, you need that mammologist perspective, but also, you know, we've got a lot of bacteria that's on us and in us. And so my friend Lolly, who's also in Curly Hair Mafia, she knows a lot about that because, you know, again, we get back to the microbiome kind of idea. We're not alone. No. <laughs> in this thing. Like, so if something affected him, it would affect the entire. So he has some freaking hella unique microbiome. Is that the sort? Is that playing some major role? I mean, well, I've always thought, honestly, that it was a three step process. I thought he was injected with something at some point, And then the second part of the process was the soup, because I just don't think the soup did it alone. But that's just me because people think I'm crazy when I say this <laughs> no I think but I think that there's so much you know I think and I think that there's little clues that that that's what I love about talking to fans mm-hmm. is that just like with scientists if we all did the same experiment no matter how you know a titration like mm-hmm. standard chem- we would all do it slightly differently but within spec we'd all observe something differently and we'd come together and we'd have a lot of the same stuff but then we'd have these really interesting things that would make you know i would go i never even thought about that mm-hmm. or that's a really good question and i really love that about fandom science because you get so many different perspectives and people picking up i mean I've read fan wikis that I'm like, this is next level analysis. <laughs> right? Like, this, this is, is a dissertation. Soldier spy stuff. Right? Wow. Like, chart, right? Like, <laughs> and but when you think about it, you're like, I would never. But this is harnessing, right? This is what why supergroups exist, where scientists work mm-hmm. in teams, because you're gonna see everybody is gonna have this vision, and it's gonna be at the edges where. You know, you didn't go. That is where the awesomeness is going to occur. And so that's why I love these types of things, because it's the fringe that people bring to everything that you're like. Exactly. (laughs) Now, you the tell me a little bit um, before I let you go, I want people to know about other things that you're working on. So I know we have obviously Curly Hair Mafia. That's the crew on Twitter find them their commentary on um pop culture and 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 media and stuff from a scientific perspective you guys are absolutely hilarious um (laughs) the we talked about dragon con what is diy are you still working on that yes so i'm i'm the creator and manager this is year five okay and it is the do-it-yourself science zone for geek girl con and that is an experimentation space where you can come in and do about a dozen to 15 different experiments, do them yourself. A scientist will be there to help you. Um, And you can do all kinds of stuff. We, you know, DNA extraction from strawberries. Um, We did an experiment where, you know, you could learn about statistics to survive a zombie apocalypse. Uh, (laughs) You know, very lighthearted. Uh, you know, last time we had rockets, you know, that you can make with just water and, and Alka-Seltzer mm-hmm. and slime. Mm-hmm. I love making it. Kids love making it. Because slime? Live creature. Oh, yeah. Slime <laughs> is the best. We had tarantulas. Ooh. Learn a little bit about insects and different types of bugs. What's the difference between a millipede and a centipede? Um, and so, you know, we have all kinds of experiments. And it's it's all people can just go in and they get little Explorer tracker badges and 
and there's prizes and it's just a really fun space for people of all ages to do science so i do that that will be geek girl con this year is okay. september 30th october 1st will be open both days mm-hmm. uh, and it's got some great programming too and then i also started writing uh, trace analysis which is a forensic science monthly column for chemistry world so you can find that online um i've done three columns all about different murders wow <laughs> um actually no the first column was i, I don't want to spoil it but okay it was don't tell actually, me <laughs> uh, it was a mass poisoning wow um, and it was it happened uh to the what's called the california or what was called the conservation corps um roosevelt was a job saving device uh, during the great depression Mm -hmm. and at one of their camps uh there was a mass poisoning of 43 wow wow and so we we talk about I talk about you know the the science of it, but also the history and the forensic science. It's it's basically, it's a sciency true crime column. Awesome. Uh, and so if people like true crime or friends, so if you like you know kind of a serial or you know anything like that, this is just you know it takes the forensic science bit and and gives it kind of a centerpiece yeah um so if you like that check that out it would be great my next one will be on my experiment Mm, with the pork (laughs) those are my my poor attempt at evil fingers (laughs) evil fingers octopus whatever works (laughs) jazz Jazz hands <laughs> and so we can always find you at uh because wh- where do you hang out most twitter facebook instagram twitter twitter, twitter. okay yeah. and on there you are your twitter handle dr rubidium dr rubidium well thank you so much i really appreciate hanging out with you this is so much fun <laughs>